What am I on? Part five? Yep. Part five of January 5th lecture on the lower limb. Now we're talking about muscle firing patterns or muscle activation sequences. Same set. A lot of synonyms and terminology for the same thing. So you will pick them here. I don't think I've touched anything too good. So one of the most com the most common dysfunction. What is it? Generalized low back pain. Mm -hmm. Yep. And all of that you end up tying into it. SI uh, joint based pain. Uh, just regular low back, whether it be nerve impingement like sciatica, or it's a joint instability problem like SI joint based stuff, ends up being there's disc herniation, degenerative disc disease, there could be spinal fusion, all that kind of stuff. The body tends to adapt in pretty common ways. And so what we will tend to see, especially as people come less and less mobile in response to the pain, the more it hurts, what do people do? They stop doing it. And that's really the worst thing that they can do to themselves, is to stop moving and doing that movement as regularly as possible. And so for us, we decided to be vertical creatures, glute maximus is supposed to be a big part of helping us stand up and walk. The fibers of glute fire, if I was going to tell you which, when glute is isolated and fires the most, it's in hip hyperextension. So once we're past zero, it's taking the leg past that into hyperextension. You will not see an elite runner or a jumper that doesn't have really strong glutes. So if that helps reinforce just the importance of it. And it's gotten more and more in vogue, just like core strengthening, as things really become more and more embedded in popular culture. It's less about the six pack and it's more about obliques and core. That's gotten more normalized. The other piece, if these are what we need strong in the front of us, what I need strong in the back of me are my glutes. Those two together, the obliques and glutes, are really what can work together to take the stress off of our spine. We want most of the movement to occur using the glutes, not the muscles right here by the spine. Those muscles really should be more about the stability, holding the spine nice and static, so there isn't a lot of stress on the discs. So when people um, lose core strength and glute strength, the posture tends to exaggerate go into a lordosis like this, and that puts a lot more stress on the spine directly. The more engaged the core, the more flattened out this lumbar curve tends to be, and the less stress on the disc, disc sphincter. So there's three muscles to think about, the erector spinae, gluteus maximus, and then the high hamstrings. And it's remembering what I was showing on the muscle model, the hamstrings, though they split down here, they come together and they track medial up onto the issue. So it's remembering that the hams, the high hamstrings are much more medial than people think. So when I'm palpating, I'm going to be trying to feel those three structures. What can mess your head up here is, is and Sandy alluded to it, you, when you're looking and thinking about the muscle anatomy, that lumbar dorsal fascia, if I were to look at the fiber direction of glutes and lats, especially on those pictures, you'll tend to think and see that the fibers tend to follow the same orientation. Glute fibers go this way on an angle toward the low back, and the lats go on an angle down toward the low back, meeting at the lumbar dorsal fascia. So for myofascial connective tissue stuff, this becomes a really important piece because it's where this leg ends up inter and hip interfaces with the opposite side shoulder. So during gait, we don't walk with the same side flexing at the same time. It's always opposites, right? Opposite leg swing with opposite arm swing. So on the back side of us, this is a really good example of how that all 
ties in. That being said, so we know the big X happens here. That means that if the right side erector spinae with the left side loops, we have to do an X. And it's, so it's this, it's the left side loops and hamstrings working together with the right side erector spinae. So left side loop maximus high hamstrings working with left side erector spinae. Now, I usually have a bit more luck in getting clients to do the right movements for me rather than just verbally trying to explain it. I'll try to grab their body and show them the movement and assist them with it. That's just my two cents on how to help articulate this for people. Some people are more or less body aware than others. So if I explain to a person, okay, I'm gonna be assessing how your low back and your glutes are firing, but I'm gonna be happy to do you're gonna be lifting this leg straight up off the table. Very good. What I want is the whole leg to lift. What people will do is they'll leave their ankle on the bolster and just do the knee. And that's cheating. <laughs> they have to lift the whole leg. If I'm wanting to make sure I'm safe, you know, if it hurts them to do that movement, then maybe I have to divert to not do that movement with this person. Um, options can be getting the pillow under the abdomen to decrease, because when somebody's laying flat on the table, that does exaggerate the lumbar um, curve there. So that's a good, if somebody comes in with active sciatica, any kind of active low back pain, putting a pillow under their tummy can flatten out the spine and make it much more comfortable, as well as safer for you to have to do this movement, because if there's one movement here that can feel scary or hard for someone to do, if they have low back symptoms, it's lifting that leg. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just hard, yeah. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of weight and leverage on the low back. So mm -hmm. if it hurts to do, don't do it. Now, uh, so what I'm gonna be trying to assess is this low back and the opposite glute. It's going to be easier for you what we're assessing in your paperwork is all three but rather than trying to feel all three at the same time make it a little bit easier on your brains and feel two at a time two at a time two at a time then you can start pattern building but if you're trying to if you're not used to assessing this and you're trying to why assess three things when you can assess two things so the key one that I always start with, and is frankly the most important, is comparing opposite side low back to the glute. So you're gonna have me lift that left leg. Very good, down. Then I'm gonna assess the opposite. So lift the, no, I said the wrong leg. So, so right leg versus left leg. Good. And actually, before it starts to change, it would behoove you guys to feel this because she does have some good asymmetry. So everybody come over, try a quick assessment on this one. I'm not gonna do this every time, but it's a good example where you may feel more tone on one side low back. Good. Everybody just do it once and hope that you feel what you're supposed to. of the hands. And the other day we'll all be pairing up and doing all the assessment on each other and feeling it again and again and again. So did we feel that one was different than the other? What I had felt was the left side will backfire first it fired before the right hip glute, but on the opposite, it fired better. That the right low back fired after the left glute. And you can feel a little bit tone-wise, that there's a bit more tone here and here. 
I could tell that when you did it. Mm -hmm. I watched it. I and you can also, that's that. a big one to tell. Either you'll see it actually jump up, or you can even see how much of a struggle there is. It was more of a struggle on the right than the left. Yep. Okay. Yep. So the harder one to lift, now thinking in the context of what that means for a person in their day-to-day -day activities, if it's more of a struggle to do the movement, that's going to be more tiring. You know, so the more, the idea of these spine patterns is related to what's the most efficient way a body can move and expending the least amount of energy to get us through a certain motion. And if things are firing in the wrong way or everything's firing together rather than in a sequence, that's lost energy. So then every single time somebody's walking or moving, they're expending more energy maybe on one side versus the other. We all do this. We favor one leg, we favor one arm. So the asymmetry will always be there. You will not find a perfect person that fits the muscle model and everything you say and see in the books. So then the next one I would palpate is the glutes versus the high hamstring. Okay? So just the right leg. Very hamstring dominant. Anybody saw that? Now that's a very common facet of this is what we'll use our high hamstrings instead of the glutes. So again, on this side. And that fired more at the same time. And I tend to actually consider firing at the same time, eh, the less of two evils. So how would I fix this? I inhibit one and have them do the movement, inhibit the other and have them do the movement. Now the easiest one is to inhibit the low back, the erector spinae, and have them do the movement because I'm not limiting the hip. If I push on the high hamstrings and have her try to lift the leg, that's gonna be a lot harder because I'm holding the leg down, right? So another option for this, and it makes the most sense with this one in particular, is I could inhibit and have a person just isometrically contract the glutes. But I could inhibit the low back and explain to them, okay, I want you to try really hard just to fire only your left glute without even having to lift the leg. See if you can kick that left glute down. Yeah. Hard yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. There you get it. There we go. If they have to fire both glutes at the same time, I mean, just how do you say butt punch? You know, <laughs> in a technical term. How do I, how do I, how do I frame that properly? Squeeze your cheeks. Squeeze, yeah. But activate glutes. Yeah, they understand what I'm saying. But you could, that's still sending a signal to the nervous system. I'm inhibiting here and having them activate here. So if the movement is difficult to do, using that isometric contraction is an option. So, that's, so we're going to assume it's wrong. This one is wrong. So just so the camera can see, I'll stand a little bit at a different angle. I would inhibit the side, the low back that's firing too much. Just compression to the optimal range. So I'm going to compress you to me with the pressure just right. Okay. And then it doesn't have to be a big lift. So I have to lift that right leg. Hold. And down. I just maintain my compression. I am just stable inhibitory pressure. And up, hold, and down. And then up, hold. Five to 10 seconds is ideal, but sometimes people aren't that patient. And down. Careful, I can feel under your arm. You trying to make it not do it. But it's, we'll get there. A little bit lift. Three to four times about all I usually do. And down. And good. The challenge with this for us as the practitioner is having good body mechanics so that you're maintaining a really good stable compression. Your compression should be the same depth of pressure and not moving around. You're just, in this case, it's really about muscle tone. So you're just holding that pressure as stable and for as long as you need to. Three to four motions is about all you usually need to do in terms of time management in a session, etc. It's all that really tends to make sense. And it behooves you to do both sides and to try to kind of even them out. 
maybe not as many repetitions in the side of the firing batter, but if you're looking for just the shortcut routine, it can be they have low back dysfunction. I have an intuition that the glutes aren't firing enough. So how do I integrate this into my regular massage and not have it feel too discordant? I could just start my application. And they, they, I walk into the room, make contact, and say, okay, we're gonna do a little bit of an assessment. Let's check these. Have them do the motions, feel everything. When we get to the knee flexion, I can get that all out of the way right here. Then just do your regular routine in prone. And before I turn them in sideline, I come back up and I have them do those motions. It fit better with my routine. It allowed the client to lay there and just enjoy the massage in prone. Then I redrape them. This works really good just going over the sheet. So compression of the low back to lift the opposite leg. We're on the other side of the table. Compression of the low back, lift the opposite leg. Okay, turn on your side. I'm going to have a move anyway. So it just fit a bit more nicely. Then as far as like the satisfaction element of things is that I can massage. If I'm really thinking profoundly about my assessment, I assess here, do my just general massage. And once I'm already here intervening, I can be feeling again and see if just through doing the general massage did anything. You might find that having just done the regular portion of the massage, things are already firing better. So even though I immediately go to even though I might look like sometimes I'm going immediately to the intervention, I can be right here and then feeling over here. And if it's firing too much, I just have to do it a few more times to maintain my compression. So that's for the hip extension or hyperextension technically. When they're here and we're having them lift their leg up off the table, it's technically hyperextension. Even though everywhere you'll see it listed, they'll call it hip extension. So if you want to be a snob, you say it's hyperextension. So the next piece that we would look at is the high hamstrings and how those are firing. If I'm going to inhibit those, it's going to be I have them start to do the motion, just start to lift the leg. That's enough. See how I can just train a person where they don't have to fully clear the table, but I can feel that they're contracting the structures I'm looking for. Relax. Now to get compression here, is it easier for me to do it this way or that way? And yeah. it's harder on my wrist, trying to get pressure here or reaching across the table and just doing that. Mm -hmm. This is easier. Mm -hmm. So for the medial thigh, the high hamstrings or even the AD vectors, if I bring my leg hips apart just a little bit, say I bend the knee, turn out just a touch, even if it's just general massage. Going across table can be a way to access those structures if you can't do it in side line. That's just for the general massage. But if I'm going to inhibit those high hamstrings related to this firing pattern, then I could apply pressure here and then just start to lift that left leg. Yep, right there. Very good. Just like this a little bit. Right there. That's all we need. They don't need to go through the full mo movement. Her hamstrings are quite strong. And relax. And then again. Good, excellent. That was already more controlled. And relax. And again. And relax. And I want to do that on both sides. So the pattern tends to be, you're thinking about the muscles and then the order. One, two, three. One, two, three. I don't inhibit one, I inhibit two and three. And have them do the movement. So, knee flexion. There's only one and two. This is a bit more convenient. It should be hamstrings first, then gastroc knee. I'll have you just start to bend your left knee. Excellent. She fires great. And bend your left knee. Fires spectacularly. Hamstrings really good and down in that movement pattern. 
And this is relatively common. I don't see knee flexion, firing pattern problems as much as I do the hip hyperextension. It tends to be that the hamstrings get way too strong at both ends, at the hip and the knee. At the knee, it's okay, but we usually want to call them down up at the hip. All right, so I'm just trying to make myself accelerate here a little bit. So then sideline. I'm going to take a bolster out from underneath the bolster. Is there a population that you see where it is more active at the lower hamstrings than the gastro? Are you saying yeah, where gastro does come in? Mm -hmm. um, ACL. <laughs> ACL injuries, that's restricting the femur and trapping the anterior. When you have an ACL problem or people like Sandy chose not to get the ACL reconstruction, gastroc, sense of where, where it attaches in the posterior femur, can try to be an ACL. So for a person with ACL injury, I would expect gastroc to be stronger, and I might not mess with it. That's what I was gonna say, yeah. Okay. I might be like, you're trying to be an ACL and a gastroc, probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe tone it down like this, but nothing crazy. Right, you might bring the tone down to help with their symptoms, yeah. but I want that strong. Yeah. For an ACL person, high gastroc has to be strong, and then you gotta take off, right? Mm -hmm. It'll work out, you'll see all this again. Yeah. So, <laughs> are you gonna be in tomorrow? No. Okay. Well, I won't see you tomorrow then. Yes, you'll be dealing with Mr. Ryan. Oh, man. Fun. He's good people. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Bring, bring the snark. He'll snark back at you. Okay. Bye. All right, so turn on whatever side is best for you. And I'll be eating the apple today, so don't think you're just sitting one side working on it. Okay. You won't walk out here. Right, it's not too crooked. Oh, man. <laughs> um, do I have a square guy? Oh yeah, there they are. So, square bolster. So we're gonna bring, actually I have to, so, let me show this access point from the subject, we'll bring this thing forward. You want a pillow under your head there? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. So this is what I was talking about with getting to the propulsion uh, muscle group. If I had to give you my key thing related to being more efficient with massage, it's that um, I found ways to work on the hip in front of the supine just fine. Sometimes this gives me some good mechanical advantage, but if the client's especially broad, it can be difficult if I don't have a step or a hydraulic table. But especially here, um, I can save a lot of energy, and I don't massage the lower leg in supine. I just get all of the leg taking care, lower leg taken care of in prone and sideline. Oftentimes, I frankly don't even work on the lower leg at all in prone. I do it only in sideline. I have a thing. So since I hurt my wrist, I literally have been doing sideline so much more. Yep. Because I, I notice how much how much pressure it puts on the wrist to do anything oh, supine extra that yep. you need than you need to. Even the neck to grow under. Yes. Just, we're not talking about that today, but yeah. But prone supine tends to force you to have to adapt because you're usually having to lean further forward to get their body. Let's say a person just lays there with their legs are together and their arms are together. So if you're trying to get to the erector spinae right by the spine, you're having to reach over to the middle of the table. If you're trying to get to the hamstrings, you're reaching over to get more to the middle of the table. Sideline, I can bring their body and their limbs more to the edge of the table. So I don't have to bend over more, and I can use my forearms more too. So here, if I just change my orientation, if I step away and make contact, I'm gonna be on the more anterior side. If I step a little bit forward and come more straight down, I'm gonna be on the lateral. So my routine with being, these were big. When I get somebody that's normal size, I'm actually going, oh, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so, <laughs> here it's like with, with her, if she was the client that probably would use my palm more, but forearms work pretty good. So here, taking tibialis anterior extensor digitorum, step, fibularis longus. Tibialis anterior, sensor digitorum, 
tubularis pedalis. And just work my way down, I'd cover both compartments. I could do that forever. If I am sneaking and bring my other hand and grab the gas truck, the best knee I've ever that I can do for this, palm here, getting that whole anterior quadrant. Think all of it, all the shin muscles, this hand all the way over on the medial side of the gas truck, and twist it all in one go. Getting every single muscle of the lower leg at once. And if I edge up, kind of get a little bit behind gas truck and soleus, and just kind of curling my fingers a little bit, that's how I can get that tibialis posterior from the proplexes without it being too aggressive and pokey. So sideline, lower leg, really good. Here is a great option. Um, some of the draping can be awkward and your biomechanics can get a little odd because you'll end up leaning one way or the other. Your knee will make contact with the table. So it can be a good option I basically tell people to trial and error. See which one's better for you. I, for the IT band in this lateral portion of leg, tend to just take, move their body in prone and supine so that I can get to it more easily. I'll reinforce that as we get going. So the same thing here on the bottom leg, where I can get the medial portion of everything. Usually I have to scoot them back just a touch but then I'm at a perfect angle. Same thing, if I step a little bit further away, I'm more on the posterior side, I'm gonna get those high hamstrings. If I step a little bit further forward and come straight down, I'm gonna be on the adductors. What people can feel a little awkward with this is what to do with their hand. You can let your hand just rest, as if she's like this. I can let my arm pivot. Uh, it's not usually my hand's doing something like this. But your hand doesn't have to track the whole time. So you can just make contact, and they know where your hand is. If there's anything I guess I'm trying to avoid, especially as a male in this industry, it's open palm on the inner thigh. Mm -hmm. So no open palm on inner thigh. I know I'm safe. So here, they can feel where my hand is. They can feel where my hand is. Forearm, boom. My elbow is what's making the closest contact up into the inner thigh. I, long, I tend to make the sheets have a good bunch to them. And if I need to work closer up at the attachments, just go over the sheet. It's my go-to for my yes. safety. Yes. So yes. with clients you've been working with for years that you have a good relationship and they know they're not crazy people, you know, then you know that they're not gonna misconstrue what, what you're doing. doing. So first time clients, I tend to do a lot of this kind of stuff around the you top over the sheet. Right here, adductors, hamstrings, adductors, hamstrings. And just being thorough. Um, little quick positioning hacks. Here, uh, technically I should have a sanitary barrier, so put the sheet or have a towel you put between them and your scrubs. And then I can be doing all of this while inadvertently getting a little bit of that knee flexion and extension. This naturally happens. Or if I'm doing just traditional muscle techniques, I could have them push against me, and it's through extension, and here in deflection. Do you still do up on the table? Yes. Would you be willing? To reinforce that, that one? Yeah, I especially always, for you. I never know where to put my body. Especially for you, yes. Because it works good for you as well. So one key thing, not to get into a position where I over talk, but something that gets lost in gait assessment and just helping people with good functional movement, the thing that we need to be able to still do well is stand up and walk. Nobody needs to continue to be an elite runner their whole life, all right? <laughs> we, it would be ideal that we can stand up and walk for as long as possible. What gets lost is, is that when we, when we walk, we don't really pivot in rotation at the hip, okay, ideally, just so the camera can see, our toe should stay more or less pointed directly forward in front of us in the sagittal plane. 
So when we walk, we shouldn't be having these big turnouts and turn ends like that. The rotators of the hip are really more about stability. So that means that the AD vectors, if I look at this pattern, when I walk, as soon as I, I'm in a plant phase and I'm going to go into my swing phase here, this leg has to do abduction plus flexion, then abduction. Then when I switch, now what's happening on this leg during that is I'm doing an abduction with extension. But see, abduction and abduction pairs with flexion and extension. So when I swing, what do I do? I'm in extension, abduction, and hyperextension. Then here, flexing while abducting, then flexing, abducting. Then I flip around, then I'm extending, abducting, extending, abducting. No wonder the abductors and abductors can get confused and start firing just in general too much. So although when looking at the muscle firing patterns related to gait can get real complex, it's really easy for me to just go, you know what? Adductors need a good reset. So if I put, put really good compression on the adductors and have them bend their knee back and forth, hopefully I just reset the relationship to the knee. So that while they're moving the knee, the adductors just aren't firing all at once. The same thing with the adductors. So there's a little bit of a word salad. <laughs> Now for the, so here's the anatomy stuff. I talked about getting to the structures underneath the ascot control is. Here's a really good angle so that I can follow the uh, tibia and come right behind. Now, this action can be hard on the wrist. So we use their palm and try to make their palm a wedge and pull the ascot control away. Or they'll get really pointy. And that can just be uncomfortable and hurt. Soft fist is my go-to, especially for my wrist issues. Because I try to use soft fist more when I have to use my hand. And limiting the um, excursion, how big the glides are, tends to be compression with some kind of movement and stuff like this. So I'll move the ankle while I'm working out right behind the uh, tibia. The idea doesn't have to be super aggressive, but even if the idea is just to pull the astrocon soleus away so those deeper muscles have more room so they can slip and slide effectively, that can be more than enough. And then just making sure, in both cases, really good foot massage. You can get access to the arch so much better, even the top of the foot. And this and just bending metatarsals, everything back and forth. So, Coming back to firing patterns. A firing pattern sequence here at the hip, you have to change where the bolster is. That's the only annoying part about this assessment and intervention in your regular routine, is that I have to flip flop which is the bottom leg and which one's the top leg. Sorry, yeah, I had that right. That the top leg isn't bent, it's gonna be straight. So, I did say it wrong, so we're gonna get there. So, okay. so knee up. Relax forward, and then you're going to uh, flex that bottom leg forward. There you go. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Okay, top leg there. Oh, I'm making a mess of it. Oh, oh I got yeah. it. Here we go. So, what we want, if possible, is this leg at zero degrees. So, standing zero degrees. The hip should be at zero. And then what we're assessing is hip abduction. The muscles involved, they'll say the word palpating quadratus lumborum. Uh, maybe if your intention is there, but that's deep. And most people, it's pretty uncomfortable to get there, especially with using your fingertips in these assessment patterns. You're probably feeling what's called the lateral refay, which is just a technical term for a connective tissue seam, where the lumbar dorsal fascia, your obliques, everything kind of just smears together. Literally like a seam on the clothing where everything kind of gets stitched, not just here, but also deep down to the spine. 
So the lateral portion of the low back, there's a lot. You have your obliques, you're gonna catch some of the lumbar dorsal fascia, which uh, feeds into the erector spinae. So we push deeper all the way down past the rib line, we're gonna end up on quadratus lumborum and even the posterior chunk of psoas. So there's a lot right there. And I just visualize like a magician, you know, being the saw. Mm -hmm. Look at the person right in hand. So I want to palpate in general low back and comparing it to what's happening in the hip. And the shortcut is anything with the firing pattern, which in this case is going to be hip extension or abduction, glutes should be first. Should be glutes one, plantar fascia lata is two, and then low back. Easier initially for you to just feel here versus here. Hip versus low back, glutes should be one. So once I'm here, um, so I can assess, do that little palpation. We're looking for the greater trochanter. So here's the ilium, there's the greater trochanter. There's much more space here than usually you'll even uh, multiple realize. So if I'm looking for bony landmark, Top of the femur, top of the ilium, anywhere in between. I want to be right between those two. And then with the low back, just above the ilium, under the low back. So then I'm just going to have you start to lift your leg so it's not, so you're not resting it on the bolster. Okay, good. Okay, go ahead and do that movement. Back down. And then again, good. That one's pretty good. Little bit of a co-contraction, but my first my first read felt like this was okay. One weird thing that can happen here, if tensor fascia lot is especially tight, is they'll kick forward into flexion first and then lift. It'll be kind of inadvertent, they'll just do a weird little. But typically all we're looking for is that. Now, uh, how to get into the space to intervene. Your best tactic for working the low back and sideline is not this angle, not where gravity is going to take you up to the ribs. Yep, you just always bump into the top of the ilium and follow it straight down. That way you can't miss. And some people are going to be more narrow-waisted versus long. The only thing you have to watch out for is stress on the floating ribs. You can check in with the person. And I just always tell them, there's nobody where I push in this uh, tissue where it's not going to be sensitive. But they should feel no stress on the ribs. So kind of squish and get out of the way. But if I just make sure my angle is here, then I can bump into the top of the ilium and then sink straight down. Keep them in the pressure just right. Right there. Ribs okay? Pretty good? Yeah, I'll just do a quick check in. And then there's the motion. We'll lift up, good, hold, and down, and then again. I'm trying to be sneaky, maybe I put a little vibration into the tissue that I want to be more active. Relax. So maybe I try to send a signal to glute medius to wake up. Even for them to have a mindfulness of what we want to fire. I think if I verbally say we want this to fire more. Okay, go ahead and stick up. There we go. You'd be surprised. People can 